after exploring the mysteries of the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamon, my investigation of the seven churches of Revelation continues. This first part of my journey helped me realize the extent of Roman persecution against Christians in the first century. I discovered the story of some heroes of faith who were ready to die to follow their master, Jesus Christ. There are four churches left for me to discover. My investigation now leads me to Turkey on the traces of the churches of Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. What will this second chapter of my investigation reveal? What other dangers threatened these early churches of Asia Minor? According to the scriptures, these communities did not seem to be threatened by Roman persecution. However, another great danger threatened to destroy them. Some had been deceived, which led them to become corrupted until they were destroying themselves from within. And for that, Christ will rebuke them severely in the letters. Thanks to archaeology and through the light of the book of Revelation, I will try to unravel the mysteries of these ancient letters. I want to understand the cultural and local context of these churches. In what way were their challenges similar to the ones that we face? Is it possible that the warnings in these letters are still relevant today? I will start looking into this mystery in the letter to the next church right after Pergamon, which is the church of Thyatira, perverted with corruption and sexual immorality. My investigation on the seven churches of the book of Revelation is about to take an unexpected turn. The letter to the church of Thyatira is one of the most peculiar letters in Revelation, as it mentions a mysterious character named Jezebel. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. In the church in Theatira, we have two groups of people. We have the majority group that seem to be following Jezebel, but there is the minority report, the, the smaller group there that is staying true uh, to the Lord. The actual church of Thyatira does not receive much criticism. What is criticized strongly, uh, the reason for the letter being twice as long as the others, is a segment of this church, or a dissident part of this church, the followers who had latched unto the false prophetess Jezebel. The false prophetess Jezebel is portrayed as a prostitute with a harmful behavior for the church of Thyatira, as she was seducing some of the believers in the community. I will try to understand who Jezebel was and what she was being reproached with. I'm leaving the stunning archaeological site of Pergamon behind as I'm heading to a small town of Akazar in the Manasa province, about an hour away from Bergamo. Yeah, today uh, Theatira is the city of Akazar. Uh, at this very important road junction then, that linked uh, Smyrna and uh, Constantinople in antiquity and uh, Pergamum and Sardis. It was founded by the Seleucids as a military garrison. But later, during the Roman Empire, rather than being known for its military nature, it became a very important trading center. Thyatira was a city renowned for the manufacturing and marketing of purple fabrics. These fabrics were exported throughout the whole Roman world. It was a luxury goods industry. In Thyatira, inscriptions have been found that talk of the wealth of this city, 
as a supplier of wool and purple cloth. Cloth dyed purple was extremely precious in ancient times. Only the richest families could own such items. Tiatera is yet another town that is difficult to excavate because it is inhabited. You can see that the modern day town is completely built up. The few ruins left from the old city are here in the town center, but very little remains. It is not easy to excavate in Tiatera. There are very few places where archaeologists are allowed to dig. They do not find much. In the midst of all the buildings, up there on the cemetery site on the hill, we can clearly see a basilica dating from between the 2nd and 6th centuries AD. We can also confirm that the road with colonnades, which dates between the 2nd and 4th centuries and associated with the Roman era, and it is one of the most significant structures on the site. Apart from my interest in the arches that are being restored, I do not gather much useful information for my investigation. Jezebel has nothing to do with archaeology as she is only mentioned in the Bible text. The archaeological track is unfortunately not very promising at Akazar. It seems I will have to find other clues to discover what was going on in the Church of Thyatira. If there's one thing I really love about the towns I've been visiting in Turkey, it's their lively bazaars. While enjoying a Turkish tea on this terrace, I'm diving into the biblical text to understand the origin of the name Jezebel. What kind of threat did this woman represent for the community in Thyatira? Jezebel is probably not her real name. She was someone who taught and bore great resemblance to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. About nine centuries before the Book of Revelation was even written, there was a famous Phoenician queen named Jezebel who reigned in Israel. King Ahab, who ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel, had married her to seal his alliance with Tyre, which was the greatest maritime power at the time. Ahab was one of the bad kings of the northern kingdom and God sent prophet after prophet uh, to call these kings to repentance. They did not listen. Of course, the instructions were not to marry a, a idolatrous uh, woman like Jezebel, but uh, Ahab did anyway. She was accused of being like the Egyptians, whose ways were popular at the time. And she went as far as changing worship in the temple in Jerusalem, from worshiping the God of Israel, Yahweh, to that of a typical Middle Eastern god called Baal. She had asked her husband to build a temple so she could carry out her own worship in a spirit of tolerance, as we would say today. And Ahab had agreed. The problem was that at that time in the Northern Kingdom, the population was a mixture, including about 50% Canaanites who had formerly worshipped Baal. The god Baal and his female counterpart, the goddess Asherah, were idols of fertility. They were also the gods of rains and storms, and as such, they were called upon across the entire Middle Eastern world to prosper harvests and the fruits of the earth. To ensure the land would be fruitful, they would visit sacred prostitutes. Intercourse between the worshipper and the sacred prostitute was supposed to make his fields, lands and so on fertile. So this type of worship was very popular because of the involvement of sacred prostitutes. Hence, the renewed interest in a return to Baal worship that had been stamped out when the children of Israel had arrived and taken over the land. Worship of the Lord had become significantly less popular. Jezebel did not hesitate in killing the prophets of God of Israel. 
and officially set up Baal worship through a bloody reign of terror. In response to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's idolatry, the Lord sent the prophet Elijah to announce that there would be a drought throughout the land of Israel. In retaliation, Jezebel swore that she would kill Elijah, who had to flee into the desert to save his life. Later, Elijah cursed her by prophesying that she would face death and destruction, being devoured by dogs. This prophecy came to pass years later when a new king of Israel, Jehu, wiped out Ahab's family and killed all of his descendants. She comes to a very bad end because King Ahab's successor throws her out the window. We are told that chariots ride over her and dogs eat her remains. From a Middle Eastern point of view, the fact that the body no longer exists represents the most shameful death that could occur. Some time later, Jezebel became known as the personification of evil, especially for the early church. This is why we find the Jezebel of the Church of Thyatira depicted as a prostitute. Obviously, the author of Revelation intentionally chose this comparison between the false prophetess of Thyatira and this overbearing, idolatrous queen. Reference is made to a biblical historical figure, one that already had such symbolic significance in the Old Testament, and we use this image, uh, what the name represents, to help reveal something. Jezebel, we will never know her true identity, uh, she is a caricature of herself. She is now just Jezebel. And this is interesting. This is the reason for the symbolism in the book of Revelation. It uses images to help us see things. When John of Patmos says, no, this woman is Jezebel, he causes the mask to be removed and opens our eyes. It's a paradox that by covering things with a layer of symbolism, it actually exposes the reality. But what exactly did John of Patmos really say of her? The letter to Thyatira says the following. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So we have a false prophetess by the name of Jezebel who's in this church. She's a, a very strong woman uh, who is teaching uh, this message of accommodation. So we have two issues particularly, sexual immorality and food sacrificed to idols. And so they were somewhat connected. She was also involved in prostitution on two levels. Prostitution as per the real meaning of the word. And then idol worship, which is spiritual prostitution. So in the ancient world, uh, the restaurants often were at the pagan temples. Uh, and so uh, union, uh, uh, groups, uh, the ancient trade guilds would have their meetings there as well. So this becomes one of the issues. The food that's being consumed has been offered to a pagan god or goddess. As a Christian, can you go to this? Where they would be eating, then there would be sexual fornication taking place. So for the Greeks and Romans, uh, immorality was very common. And so the, the mixing of eating and sexual immorality was a, a, a real problem. Jezebel, this woman, uh, he's called this, is uh, advocating that this is all right. So this is the tension we see here in this letter. With her influence in the church, Jezebel would spur local Christian artisans and merchants to corrupt themselves by participating in pagan rituals. Torn between their faithfulness to Christ and their economic interests, they would compromise with the surrounding immorality that prevailed there. Furthermore, she would actually encourage sexual immorality and offering sacrifices to idols in the church by way of prophecies. Sexual immorality is always considered extremely serious in the Bible. It is also referenced when talking about the parallel immorality of turning away from God to someone else. God often described Israel's sin of turning away from him as unfaithfulness or sexual immorality. The Lord would say, you have cheated on me with your false gods.
the message of Theotira, I think, is a very relevant one, to, especially to Western societies today. So as we live in cultures that are increasingly secular, uh, even increasingly anti-Christian in character, immorality seems to be the common standard uh, that's uh, all around us. Is Nowadays, we come across more things in one day that have a sexual connotation than my grandfather did in 10 years of his life. How do we live in culture and be witnesses to those around us and distinguish ourselves? I mean, how we behave with our honesty, our truthfulness, our relationships with our spouses, our children. These are what distinguishes us as followers of Jesus. I think this is the real test for us today uh, as believers, uh, to live a life of holiness that uh, shows uh, our love for Jesus Christ. Above the immoral pagan practices highlighted in the letter, John condemns the pernicious behavior of Jezebel. She promoted heretical teachings, tolerating all sorts of compromises, thus leading Christians away from their devotedness to Christ little by little. One can also find other heretical teachings condemned in the letters to the churches of Ephesus and Pergamon, such as the sect of the Nicolaitans or the teachings of Bela. I think that these three groups, the Nicolaitans, uh, the followers of, of Balaam and of Jezebel, sort of represent the same issue that we're talking about here, of compromise, accommodation. All through the book there, uh, the prophetic message that John is issuing is, is to turn away from the false prophecy, the false lifestyle that's being offered if he did that then, it is still true now. So it is up to us to see what is in our life. Around us, the Jezebels, false prophetesses, who produce such bad fruit. We must be able to unmask it in order to say no. That we cannot follow. So what about the false prophetess Jezebel? What does Christ say about her in Revelation? The text warns, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. And so we see a very strong message to her, unless she repents, uh, she's gonna be put on a bed of suffering uh, and leading possibly even to death. We are almost surprised to see that Jesus suggests that Jezebel repents. The way we perceive her, we easily imagine that she has passed a point of no return. But Jesus suggests she repent. What is interesting is that the Jezebel in Revelation is called to conversion. At the end of the book, there will effectively be one woman who is completely good and one who is completely evil, Babylon versus Jerusalem. But at this point in the book, in a way, the woman who represents the community and who represents the church that is to be converted is still in between. She's wrong, but she can convert. And that would save her. Before going to the site of Sardis, I'm stopping for a few moments at Lake Marmara, located just a few kilometers away from Makazar. The church of Thyatira had to fight for holiness. John condemns the actions of Jezebel violently. Beyond the reference to the ancient wicked queen of Israel, Jezebel is the image of a church going for all the temptations of her time. Therefore, John calls the church to be more watchful and encourages them to cast away false prophets. The letter to Thyatira is equally relevant for our time. For the issue of moral compromise is without a doubt one of the largest challenges for the church in the 21st century. Thus, this letter shows us that the battle for holiness is one of the toughest battles to fight. But the eternal promises of God to his church 
are far above any fleeting temptations one may have to face on earth. It's up to the church today to seize them. I'm not done yet finding out about the extent of the compromises that weakened the churches of Asia. Now, I'm going to the fascinating city of Sardis, which is next in the book of Revelation. As for that church, she had fallen asleep spiritually. The site of Sardis is a few kilometers away from Akazar, along the valley of the Gedez River. In the foothills of Mount Tumulus, Sardis is surrounded by magnificent scenery. Life here is simple and traditional, with the inhabitants living off the vines and the fields that border what was once the ancient city. Archaeological sites dot the hillsides among the many olive groves. Today, this is one of the uh, archaeological excavations in Turkey that the Americans are involved in. So there's a very uh, active excavation going on there. In the book of Revelation, the letter to the church of Sardis holds one of the most severe reproaches among all directed at the seven churches. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What a very sad assessment. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. However, the rest of the letter shows that not everything is completely dead. But the warning is not over. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. The church in Sardis, interestingly, has no external persecution that we know of. It's not mentioned here. There also doesn't seem to be any false teaching. I'm going to look into some of the reasons for such a reproach, but first I need to take a closer look at some of the historical events of this forgotten city to help me understand it better. Way before the early Christian communities appeared here, Sardis was the capital city of the kingdom of Lydia. In 548 BC, the kingdom of Lydia was almost as extensive as modern-day Turkey. Uh, Sardis sat at the important crossroads uh, of the road that came from Pergamum down to Theatira to Sardis, and then went down to Laodicea. So as a result of this, uh, it was on a very viable, important road network. The renowned Kingdom of Lydia was famous for their wealth and ancient splendor. Legendary King Croesus, who last ruled over that country, was known for his outrageous fortune. His name remains famous with the common expression, as rich as Croesus. Uh, they were able to take gold from the nearby Pactolus River and uh, to use that wealth to build a tremendous kingdom. It was in this little stream, the river Pactolus, whose name is still referred to today, that they found gold. The first gold coins were minted in Sardis, and it was the Lydians that invented the coins we use today. Gold was panned there, and the city had many orchards and produced fine textiles. So the seat of the Lydian power was the Acropolis uh, that overshadowed the city that was below. And uh, it was noted in antiquity for being unable to be conquered. The town of Acropolis, which was built on this rocky ridge 1150 feet above the valley, is no longer visible. We can see but only a piece of a Byzantine wall built much later on a steep ledge. King Croesus was convinced that these natural fortifications were impregnable, which is what led to his ultimate defeat. 
For when the Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great invaded the kingdom of Lydia with his army in 547 BC, Croesus merely took refuge in the citadel without even attempting to defend it. The Greek historian uh, Herodotus tells us a very interesting story that one of the Lydian soldiers lost his helmet down the east side of the Acropolis. And when he went down to retrieve it, the Persian soldiers below saw that there was a secret entrance to the Acropolis. And so uh, they followed him up later and gained access to the Acropolis. And through this, uh, they were able to later uh, create a diversion and storm the Acropolis along the secret entrance from the east side. The Persians were able to invade the unguarded fortress, so Sardis was captured by stealth. Because of a lack of vigilance, uh, the Persians were able to uh, conquer uh, his citadel. The story was well known throughout Greece. So when the Lord warned the church of Sardis in verse 3, everyone understood the reference. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. This text had particular significance for locals in Sardis. But what was the real crux of the message to Christians in Sardis? Discovering more about the city's subsequent history will give me new hints to help me understand it. So after the Lydians and the Persians, uh, then the Greeks came on the scene, uh, Alexander and then the later Hellenistic rulers made Sardis again, a very important city, uh, a capital city during the Hellenistic period. Later, the town was annexed by Pergamos and its importance gradually declined. When the Romans arrived, they improved its appearance by adding tasteful public buildings. American archaeologists have been able to restore many Roman buildings in the lower part of the town of Sardis. An extensive complex of sports facilities and Roman baths is evidence of comfortable standards of living. Excavations have also enabled the discovery and restoration of the largest synagogue ever found outside of Israel. This proves that a significant Jewish community lived in Sardis and paved the way for a Christian church, just like those found in all the other cities named in Revelation. But even if the city did have some splendid buildings and appeared to offer a luxurious lifestyle, it was living in a shadow of its former glory. During Roman times, Sardis was no longer considered an important city in Asia. By this time, Pergamos and Ephesus had greater influence and prestige. And when Sardis applied to build an imperial cult temple in uh, around 26 AD, they were denied permission to build it. The, uh, the right was given to Sardis. And they said that Sardis did not have the wealth and the prestige in order to have this temple. However, Sardis has a temple of Artemis that is outstanding. There are three temples in Western Turkey dedicated to the goddess, including the ones at Ephesus and Magnesia. The one in Sardis is particularly well preserved. It is on the Western slopes of the Acropolis where landslides buried it quite deeply but the top of the two tallest columns continued to be visible over the centuries. This temple is considered to be the fourth most significant temple dating back to ancient times. Alexander the Great changed the history of the city. During his reign, the temple took on the form that we see now. Dozens of crosses and Christian slogans engraved in the marble walls reveal that the building became a church when Christianity reached the city.
I also noticed a small Byzantine church at the southeastern corner of the building. It was built in the 5th century AD. So this temple became a place for Christians to gather in the early centuries. The archaeological tracks seem to indicate that the community of Sardis was very important and extremely active. Still, Christ declares that it was dead. How could this be possible? It seems that the warning in this letter referred to the materialism and decadent lifestyle of the locals. These morals had rubbed off on the Christians and Sardis. In the literature of the time, Sardis epitomized debauchery and hedonism. Living in Sardis had come to mean being immoral. The church in Sardis was living a sham, hiding behind the veneer of a religious tradition. This whole idea of the diminishing of prestige and authority in the city is sort of taken on by the church here. And there's kind of a complacency that characterizes not only the city, but the church here as they've seen their better days, our, our past. And Jesus is trying to kind of shock them uh, awake, to jumpstart them, to once again uh, achieve the heights of spirituality and leadership that they had formerly. If you claim that Revelation speaks to passionate, persecuted congregations and comforts them, the letter to Sardis jolts you, because the letter shows us that though these churches may not have been in existence for long, they were nevertheless very well established, but had lost their zeal. And Revelation reveals Jesus saying to some, you are small and persecuted and think you will disappear, but actually, I tell you that you are not poor, you are rich. On the other hand, to a church which seems fine, which has no lack of finances or believers or is in good terms with the locals, he says, you think all is fine, but I tell you that is not fine at all. It really is a matter of appearances being exposed for what they really are. The problem of Sardis is that it's a church that had fallen asleep, that had dozed off. It's all about what Jesus decrees as spiritual lethargy, getting ensconced in worldly pleasures, riches, comfort, and so on. And the Lord is no longer the first priority. This is described as being in a state of spiritual death. And this aptly describes the Sardis church. Even though it looked great, had lovely buildings and apparent elegance, etc. But actually, God's presence had left. It was not enough to have had personal experience at the start. This reminds us of the church in Ephesus, which had lost its first love. When we first meet with God, it obviously has had a marked effect on us. But little by little, if we neglect that relationship with the Lord, we start depending on past experiences rather than present ones. Yet God is always the God of today. Firmly. This is what Christ protests in his letter. The fact that the church in Sardis has concentrated on religious ritual rather than a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was sent by God the Father on the day of Pentecost to guide Christians and to display the power of the kingdom of God on earth. The Holy Spirit is a person so every time we try to manufacture something spiritual, we have lost sight of the person of the Holy Spirit. The church dies as soon as the Spirit of God withdraws. And a dead church is a church that is already cut off from God because of the absence of the Holy Spirit. Even if it continues to sing or to carry out its rituals, even if it continues on like a well-oiled machine, it is actually completely dead. From the outset, Christian rituals and the way the Christian message have been applied have evolved and changed. 
the church has lastingly been impacted by several momentous events. The first major event in history took place in the fourth century. After two centuries of persecution, Christians were growing in number and influence throughout the Roman Empire to the extent that the Emperor Constantine himself became a Christian. Constantine saw Christianity as a means of unifying uh, the empire. And so there was a political motivation as well for him uh, singling out the church. But uh, this, of course, is a very important transition period uh, in the empire when Christianity becomes normalized now as a uh, legal religion. But the official acknowledgement of Christianity will also have a flip side. Roman emperors had the title of Pontifex Maximus, or chief high priest of all their pagan religions. When Constantine was converted and became a Christian, he therefore considered himself to be head of the church as well. The entry into the church not only becomes through conversion, but also becomes through being simply born into the empire. And uh, so the personal expression of faith begins to become lost, and Christianity becomes a political reality rather than a religious one. Society was no longer evangelized, but Christianized, which did not mean that people got converted. In the Middle Ages, it was the church that inherited the rule of a declining Roman Empire. As the church progressively asserted its independence, tensions increased between the institutional church and the political power. The society will gradually become shaped into a social model controlled by the church, which will become very powerful. And the popes started to play an increasingly political role. They took the title Pontifex Maximus. Inevitably, that created ongoing tension between political and religious power. But several substantial reforms will take place within the Catholic Church, marking a return to the simplicity of the Gospel. By the end of the Middle Ages, a new movement emerged, criticizing abuses, passionately longing for purity, and a return to the origins of Christianity. This is where the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century started. The protest movement against the Catholic Church would shake all of Europe. It will be initiated by a monk named Martin Luther in Germany. Martin Luther was a monk who had a very powerful spiritual encounter and condemned the practice of indulgences popular in Rome at the time. The Catholic Church had established a system of selling indulgences whereby the faithful could pay for their salvation and reach heaven more quickly. This trade also contributed towards the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This was obviously the expression and practical outworking of religious legalism and spiritual blackmail. Upon the careful study of scripture, Martin Luther discovered that salvation is obtained by grace through faith. Then he would draft his 95 Theses, in which he condemns the selling of indulgences, as well as other dogma which he considers to be deviances. Luther is not the only one to criticize some of the church's dogmatic principles. Some great bishops and Catholic theologians also do this, while still remaining loyal to the official institutions. Via the printing press, Luther's dissenting ideas spread across the whole of Europe. This movement led to the gospel being preached once again. Luther preached several doctrines, particularly those of sola gratia, grace alone, and sola fides, faith alone, plus sola scriptura, the importance of the holy scriptures alone, repeated at the time of the Reformation, this resulted in the gospel being preached once again to all. Luther was not aiming to set up another church. Regrettably, it was the papacy's obstinacy, at the time which in demanding that Luther deny his beliefs and then excommunicating him for his refusal to do so. 
highlighted the religious dissent that became Protestantism. In that debate, Catholics and Protestants would never reach a consensus, and so the schism would become unavoidable. The political interests of rulers quickly took precedence over spiritual concerns, and powerful German princes adopted the Reformation in a bid to be independent of the papacy. This is exactly the same as what happened with Constantine. Whole regions left Catholicism for Lutheranism, without this necessarily meaning that there were real conversions. It was merely a question of transferring from one form of religion to another. Numerous conflicts and civil wars broke out in Europe, where religious wars between Protestants and Catholics caused tremendous tragedy. Both sides committed violent acts completely at odds with the gospel's message of love. Reform efforts, diversity within a community is a good thing. Uh, St. Paul says, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So it is good that this exists, but when division consumes us, it creates two camps, and we caricaturize each other and lose essential things. They could all enrich each other, but wanting to go their own way, they start claiming, we're definitely not going to do that because it's Catholic, or we're definitely not going to do that because it's Protestant. And in the end, they lose the treasure that is common. This spiritual conflict completely divided the Western Church into two camps. In the following centuries, other factions, mainly Protestant denominations, began to emerge in Europe and the American colonies. They called for a transformation of heart and changes in society by preaching the kingdom of God as in the time of the apostles. These revivals were known as the Great Awakening. Revival is not a word that is found in the Bible. It is a word fashioned by evangelical streams birthed from the end of the 18th century onwards into the 20th century. It is a return to Bible basics, and revival is based, as it should be, on the idea of repentance. The history of revivals shows us people who have learned to practice the presence of God. The people getting converted were pastors and elders. It became clear that you can be part of a church, advocate a religious system, and yet not really be converted. In the last 30 or 40 years, there has been a new phenomenon, that of the great historical religious traditions losing credibility, no longer being trusted, both Protestant and Catholic. So often people conclude that God is dead when counting the number of empty seats in churches, for example. But this is just superficial. We should go beyond that. It is true that the religious landscape has become fragmented. But I would say that religion is changing rather than collapsing. So the field is very, very open now, wide open. There is huge turmoil going on. In the 20th century, these revivals birthed what became known as the Charismatic Movement, both in Protestant and Catholic circles. These spiritual sensitivities allowed for the great diversity within Christianity as we know it today. These movements have spread like wildfire in several areas of the world. People are eager to experience once again the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power and the miracles of Jesus as promised in the text of the New Testament.
The word Reformation is a word that should have a permanent place in the history of the Church. There is always need for Reformation. The history of the Church is a continuum highs and lows and successive Reformations. The letter to the Christians in Sardis is a reminder for his followers in every generation that Jesus does not bury dead churches, but rather awakens them by the power of his Holy Spirit. Every revival loses its way after three generations. The third generation is the one that is not even aware that one can experience things with God. It lives according to doctrines, to traditions, to rituals, but has no direct contact with the Lord. Effectively, God has become the grandfather. And when that is the case, God starts from scratch again. He finds a man, like he found Luther or Wesley or Finney, etc., who preaches the basics of the gospel once more, and who once again gives the Lord sons and daughters rather than grandchildren. So there is almost always a continual pendulum swing. And in each generation, there will be men and women set on fire by the Spirit of God who will be able to see beyond the moment uh, into the mysteries of God and be able to lift the veil and say, no, that won't do. With Thyatira and Sardis, the list of reproaches to the churches seems to be a continuation of the churches before them. However, there is one particular case that appears to be an exception to this pattern, as I will discover in my next stop where I examine the Church of Philadelphia. The letter to Philadelphia is the one that is mentioned the most as a reference among the seven churches of the Book of Revelation. Interestingly, it contains no reproach at all. I know your deeds. See. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Alongside Smyrna, it was the only other church not to be reprimanded by the Lord. However, he did appeal to the members to do certain things. The Lord highlights their faithfulness. It probably is the most surprising city to receive a letter again, because it's the least important, uh, the least developed uh, among the other cities. So in terms of its history, its significance, it's the least of all of these. It didn't stand out to others. It was not one of the largest churches, but it stayed faithful. It's a wonderful model for all the churches. A pastor's aspire to have a congregation like Philadelphia's. In what way does this church exemplify faithfulness? What extra ingredient makes it so exemplary compared to others? Forty-five kilometers through a long, fertile plain separates Sardis from the site of Philadelphia. Today, the city is called al -Shahir. It was located on the road connecting Sardis to Laodicea. It was noted in antiquity even for the wine growing, uh, the grape growing uh, that was around uh, the area, so very fertile agricultural lands then. And even today, it's still noted for its uh, grapes that produce raisins uh, in this region. So there is this huge white plain, very fertile, so abundant. The plains of the Hermes River and the Kogamis River uh, attribute to the Hermes are among the most fertile lands in the world. The ground contains volcanic rock, which made the region extremely farmable. But the volcano's activity also causes frequent earthquakes. Western Turkey is an earthquake zone, and even today we shake continuously, but we don't feel most of the time. 
but big earthquakes have been uh, recorded in our history, the last one being in 1969. And I do remember that uh, Alashir uh, was badly affected and most of the villages were rebuilt by the government. Alashahir means colorful town in modern Turkish. Today, it is a small town in the province of Manisa in Turkey. The residents welcome me in the typical hospitable and heartwarming way of this nation. The city of Philadelphia is the most recent among the cities of the Book of Revelation. And it was founded by the Pergamon king Attalos II in the second century BC. So after a while, uh, since the Pergamon kingdom was bequeathed to the Romans, uh, the city became part of the Roman Empire, like the, the Western Turkey today, and uh, just uh, became a Roman city. Philadelphia was uh, late with the development of buildings. It probably originally was surrounded by a wall. Uh, we have few remains in the city of Alashi here today. Uh, the modern city is built again over the ancient city. And one of the things that all the visitors to Philadelphia see are three very large pillars from a Christian church uh, called St. John's Church that commemorated uh, the importance of Philadelphia in the Book of Revelation. And that's a sixth century building. There are some traces of wall painting on it. And the site is uh, opened up like a museum, like an open air museum. And uh, what they found uh, all over the city, all the small finds are, uh, you know, like tombstones and so on, are on display on the grounds. But from the church itself, you just see three huge square piers, masonry piers, and starting off some brick vaults, and that's it. Unfortunately, you don't see much. These three massive pillars, which only give a vague idea of what this Christian basilica once was, are the last historical traces of a presence of a Christian culture that are left in Philadelphia. They are witnesses of a change in the civilization that occurred in that region in the 13th century. For nearly a thousand years, Western Anatolia was under the control of the Byzantine Empire, which had followed the Roman Empire and had an Orthodox Christian culture. But in the 13th century, the conquest from the Turkish Muslim Beliks, the forerunners of the Ottoman Empire, had weakened the empire and was breathing almost its last breath. By that time, the Byzantine city of Philadelphia was surrounded by enemies, but resisted greatly against the Turkish attacks, while other cities around them had surrendered to the enemy. It remained independent for nearly a century, like the bastion of Hellenism, standing firm against the Ottoman conquest. Nevertheless, the city was conquered in 1390 ahead of the fall of the great city of Constantinople in 1453, which sealed the end of the Byzantine Empire and of Christianity in Turkey. This part of the history of the city is interesting for my investigation, as it shows how brave the inhabitants in the city were, as they put up a heroic resistance in that hostile environment. This also reminds me of the perseverance of the Christians in Philadelphia, honored in the letter for their faithfulness to Christ. But it is even more unsettling to realize here in the middle of these ruins how great the symbolic value of the pillar as mentioned in the letter to Philadelphia is. For these ancient pillars standing here in the middle of the city of Alashahir echo particularly with the end of the letter. 
Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. The one who is victorious I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. It's fascinating to consider this tangible illustration representing the promise which had been made to the Church of Philadelphia. What did this image mean for the Christians in the city? An event in the history of the city gives us a better understanding of how relevant this detail in the letter was. Indeed, a few years before the book of Revelation was written, a terrible disaster happened, which left its mark upon all who lived here. In AD 17, there was a very strict earthquake uh, which devastated uh, like 12 cities in Western Turkey. And all these uh, cities, including Sardis, uh, were uh, toppled down. And uh, the Emperor Tiberius then, son of Augustus, Tiberius sent aid to these cities to rebuild them, and they were exempted from taxes for five years, including Philadelphia. Strabo, the ancient geographer from Amasya, again in Turkey, uh, states that uh, he wondered how the locals loved the spot because it was continuously shaken with earthquakes. The walls were continuously cracking and they were continuously repairing the walls. He talks about how people had to flee the city because of earthquakes. They were afraid to go back because of the aftershocks uh, that were there. So this was an ongoing uh, issue with Philadelphia. Instead of rebuilding after earthquakes, parts of the population lived in tents, an indication of uncertainty. A reference to a column indicates stability. It indicates something lasting. This speaks to the church of a situation that is no longer uncertain, but one that is stable and secure for eternity. A pillar is indestructible, immovable. It cannot be shifted. It pictures something secure and lasting. And it is in the temple. If God places us in his house like this as pillars, that means that nothing can shake us or remove us from there. It is a firm promise. Obviously, for the residents of Philadelphia, this had great significance, and even more so for the church which now knew that it rested on unshakable foundations, the foundation of Christ. There was also an interesting tradition in Philadelphia, which consisted in engraving the names of public figures and important people of the city on the columns of some temples. This is how they would carry on the memory of those who had impacted the life of the city. The reference to this tradition in the letter is quite obvious. This is an interesting phenomenon we see uh, around Western Turkey uh, in certain temples of writing names on columns. People who are the elite of the city who serve as priests uh, in the imperial cult as also uh, leaders in the city. And of course, the Christians are not going to get their names written in columns like this because they have an alternate kingdom, an alternate uh, reality, uh, and they're not aspiring for status and fame in this life. And so always throughout Revelation, we're pointing to a different reality, a different kingdom that uh, John and Jesus are trying to get uh, the followers of the Lamb to uh, live in this kingdom. The letter to the Church of Philadelphia is a tribute to their unfailing faithfulness. 
In this letter, Christ declares how strong, reliable, and certain the promises of God are, as opposed to the weaknesses of a city subjected to the hazards of earthquakes. Throughout centuries of civilizations, the pillars of the Basilica of St. John still remain as a symbol of that promise today, a promise beheld by all those who, encouraged through this letter, persevere and remain faithful to Christ. This church, which has little strength in human eyes, is nonetheless the one that Christ honors the most. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he confirms this point. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. This verse is such a good illustration of the reality of the Church of Philadelphia. There is one last step for me to finish my investigation. I am now going on the tracks of the Church of Laodicea a major Roman city in the province of Asia Minor. In spite of their importance and influence in the city, this church receives one of the worst reproaches among those directed at the seven churches of Asia. But before arriving at the archaeological site of Laodicea, I make a stop not far from there, at one of the most irresistible places in Turkey, Pamukkale, which means Cotton Castle in Turkish. The site is renowned since antiquity for its famous thermal spring water. If you go to Laodicea today, uh, you'll notice to the north of the city these white cliffs uh, that are hanging off the side of the, the valley to the north. Well, these are a natural formation, uh, we call them travertines, and above these is the ancient city of Hierapolis. The natural thermal spring waters leave a limestone deposit on the rocks, covering it in a white coating, giving the mountain the appearance of a cotton fortress. It is a very popular destination for tourists. Since its foundation in the second century BC, the thermal city of Heropolis was very popular in ancient times for its natural springs. There were many inhabitants in the city, as evidenced by the impressive archaeological site of Heropolis today, which has several buildings dating back to the Roman era, much of which is very well preserved, such as its theater. The city of Laodicea was 10 kilometers south of Heropolis. It was as huge and impressive as the neighboring city. Laodicea was founded at the same time, around the end of the second century BC, by a Seleucid king, Antiochus II. And today is a very large site. Uh, there's a Turkish archaeological team uh, that's working at Laodicea. And when you visit the excavations that are ongoing, you see how large a site uh, Laodicea was in the ancient world. According to archaeologists, the size of the town suggests that the population must have been between 75,000 and 100,000 inhabitants in ancient times. Certainly in the Roman Empire at this time, uh, uh, comparable uh, probably with uh, a Pergamum in terms of size, but uh, certainly bigger than Theatira and Philadelphia. So the seventh of the letters is a, a very significant city. I have the good fortune to see vast sections of the site that have been discovered recently by archaeologists. They're making incredible discoveries here. During Roman times, the town became very prosperous, very fertile and very rich, extremely rich. The fertile agricultural land around the city raised cotton and things for textiles. It was noticed for its garments that it exported abroad. Cotton and wool are very important products, and there is an abundance here. Even today, the town of Denizli, which is considered to be the textile capital of Turkey, or of the Asian region at least, is in the same location. The town had an abundance of dyers, weavers, and clothiers. But there were also bankers with enormous fortunes who made the town into a major banking center. 
Laodicea was also a medical center. It was famous for its school of medicine and its treatment of eye diseases. So they would do using natural substances, herbs, uh, as well to apply as uh, uh, treatments to the eyes uh, to uh, bring healing for certain types of diseases. The combination of these factors uh, made Laodicea a, a, a very prominent and important uh, city. Laodicea was very rich, but also very Christian. Many Christian writings and signs have been discovered here. The established Jewish community there allowed for many to convert to Christianity and for the first century church of Laodicea to become very important in the following centuries. Archaeologists have discovered more than 20 churches in the town. They know where they are because they were baptisteries and east-facing apses, proving they were church building. This is a huge number for a town of around 100,000 inhabitants. So it was a very Christian town. The ruins of a very large church built in the 4th century during the reign of Constantine was excavated and restored between 2010 and 2017. This archaeological treasure is unique. Its discoveries offer new insight into the architecture of the very first Christian churches. It is undoubtedly the oldest church in the history of the Christian world that has ever been restored. The Christian community of Laodicea was founded by Epaphras, a fellow traveler of the Apostle Paul. He came from a city near Colossae, which was less than 20 kilometers east of Laodicea. The city is also well known in the New Testament with the epistle to the Colossians. There are three main cities in this area, and they're all familiar from us from uh, the New Testament, uh, Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. And they form almost a triangle here with Laodicea being in the center. However, Colossae has not yet been subjected to an archaeological dig. Apart from a tumulus indicating the position of the city of Colossae, the remains of the city are not visible. By the time John wrote the book of Revelation, the community of Laodicea was only about 40 years old. It was a second generation community. Among the seven letters, the one John wrote to them is certainly the most famous and commented on. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing that you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Christ shouts at his church openly, you are poor, blind, pitiful, and naked. It is terrible. Jesus is, uh, is really uh, admonishing this church uh, to bring them to repentance uh, over uh, behavior that he doesn't believe is worthy of them as a Christian congregation. With Laodicea, it's as if I can hear Jesus' anxiety and concern about the state they're in. The statement of Christ on the situation of the Church of Laodicea is terrible. The text gives us the strong impression that this church had lost its vision of its true spiritual state. The author volunteers a series of references to the usual way of life of the Laodiceans in the text. These references tell us even more than those contained in all other letters. So first, I need to take a closer look at the context of the city in the first century to understand the spiritual meaning of these references. In particular, there is this verse condemning its lukewarmness. What can that mean? He characterizes them as lukewarm. So many have looked at the water situation at Laodicea to explain uh, what this image is. The city of Laodicea had no spring for water. 
They had to have water come from Heropolis through an aqueduct, which conveyed hot water from the thermal springs. So you have the hot water to the north. And then as you look to the south, uh, Laodicea sits in a valley surrounded by mountains. And to the east, around Colossae, there's a very high mountain called Mount Cadmus. Most of the year, there was snow on that mountain. So you had the cold, white snow above the valley to the south. And so, and other mountains that were there too that had snow much of the year. So Laodicea is kind of framed by the hot water to the north, the snow with the cold to the south, and in between, there they are. And these represents this lukewarm condition. In the city center, archeologists discovered a huge pond, which reveals the importance of Laodicea's water supply systems. From there, water was transported to the fountains and houses of the city through a highly sophisticated piping system for that age. The system is evidence of an incredibly well-to-do standard of living and unmatched comfort for that age. The water from the area also had an emetic effect, causing people to vomit. So it's very rich in minerals, and so it has uh, this uh, emetic quality uh, to do that. And so this is the, the lukewarm water uh, was given, uh, you know, as a cleansing function to people. Warm water can give rise to microbial activity. Boiling water or cold water does not allow the same microbial activity. We could say that warm water is not fit for consumption. As Christ threatens the community to be vomited out of his mouth, the Laodiceans were obviously in a position to get the point immediately. But does the reference also contain a spiritual significance in this letter dictated by Christ? It's a refusal to make decisions. It's complete compromise. It's a lack of relationship, lack of love, lack of enthusiasm, a lack of commitment, a lack of righteousness, a lack of integrity. There is nothing else left. It's as if Christ was saying, despite all my attempts to keep you, it's not possible. The second criticism leveled at the church in the letter to Revelation is to do with its arrogance. The Laodiceans prided themselves on being rich and not needing anything. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This letter, in a sense, drips with sarcasm. Because here we have a city that's noted for its textiles, noted for its eye treatment, noted for its wealth. But Jesus says, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Laodicea had become incredibly rich and prosperous. Thanks to their businesses, their textile industry, and their banks, the inhabitants, who were proud of themselves, would live in wealth, hobbies, and a standard of living which was quite rare in that age. I also discovered that the city had two amphitheaters, one of them located west and the other one north. Here we are in the Western Theatre, where the sun is behind the stage in the morning, which is very important. The other theatre in the north enjoyed the sun from behind in the afternoon. This meant that people could watch productions at all times of day. Thus, city life revolved around entertainment. This theatre could hold around 8,000 people. The other one was much larger, holding around 12,000 people. The existence of two busy theatres shows that there was incredible wealth. This scenario is one of a kind in the Roman Empire, but that is not all there is to it. The people of Laodicea were extremely proud of their wealth, to the point that when a violent earthquake devastated the cities of the region in the year 60 AD, they could afford to refuse any and all financial help from Rome. The emperor in Rome wanted to give the city of Laodicea money to help with the rebuilding. 
And the Laodiceans said, we don't need your money. We're rich enough. Can you imagine this? What, what, what city today refuses to take money uh, for emergency relief for rebuilding? But this is the attitude of the Laodiceans. We're wealthy enough. We don't need your help. Archaeologists have found the inscription, by our own might, engraved several times in Greek on the buildings reconstructed after the earthquake, a clear indication of the independent attitude and pride that prevailed in Laodicea. It seems to be this sort of attitude in the church as well. And so this whole idea, we can do it ourselves. You know, we don't need the help. But Jesus, you know, in a sense, puts on the spiritual x-ray glasses and he exposes them for what they are. You know, they're, they're poor, blind, and naked. Here is a church that had everything and took pleasure in their material possessions, entertainment, and frivolities. But the verdict of Jesus is implacable. She has nothing. Upon further reflection, isn't that society based on economics and well-being built by the Laodiceans a bit like our modern-day Western society? Commentators on Revelation are quick to compare the challenges faced by the church in Laodicea with the modern materialistic ones faced by the church of the beginning of the 21st century. The fact that the church in Laodicea is last on the list and that it reflects a certain number of traits associated with our modern civilization could make us think that this church in Laodicea truly represents the church of the last days. Yes, I think this is especially uh, relevant for uh, the prosperous and materialistic cultures that we have in the West today, where you know, getting the newest, the latest, the best, the most expensive uh, motivates people. We have attained a level of comfort, of wealth, of prosperity unequaled in history. No generation before ours has experienced such comfort and luxury. I was just looking at statistics in the United States about the amount of debt that Americans have. We're all living above our means through credit cards, so much debt for vehicles, buying cars and trucks and on a loan and it's trillions of dollars. So the whole economy is operating on indebtedness. And people are paying, of course, interest on top of that. And for Christians, uh, this is really not the way that the kingdom should operate in terms of stewardship. And so I think this is one way that the book of Revelation speaks to us to come out. Is money possessing us? Or are we possessing our money? What would be the diagnosis if the author of the book of Revelation was looking at our world, where profit and debt have never been so high? Medicine and the pharmaceutical industry never been so advanced, and where the overproduction of textiles has even become an environmental catastrophe. Is the letter to Laodicea not surprisingly timely? Like the Laodiceans, we have built a materialistic, self-sufficient society focused on entertainment, finance, and trade. Strong spiritual values had disappeared and made for a weak, feeble Christianity in Laodicea, much as they have done in our society today. So this letter aptly describes the religious veneer of the Laodiceans, who had, in reality, shown God the door. But Christ had not finished with that church. The rest of the letter is interesting because it shows the church how to come back to him. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Christ counsels them to buy, thus inverting the roles. The language used is one that Laodicean merchants would have used themselves, 
But there, he talks about the things that will last in time and are truly valuable. I find this analogy and analysis interesting. The Church of Laodicea is invited to buy gold, which is a stable material. It is somehow invited to return to something lasting. Unlike the consumer goods that corrode, rust, and do not endure. And this is, of course, the message to the lay of the sea. This is all going to pass away. You know, everything that we work for is going to collapse. But to build for eternity and become passionate uh, about living for the kingdom and not for the present time. Don't be detracted and deflected from the goal. Let the Holy Spirit lead us and what we buy and uh, how we use our money. And God is giving us this money so we can help others, refugees, the poor, the naked, the orphans around us. So we all urgently need to get back to what real relationships are. I believe we need to understand what it means to love others and love our God. The letter ends with these words, suggesting that Christ had been ultimately thrown out by his church. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. There's a very interesting image there of Jesus at the door knocking, and he's knocking on their hearts to turn and repent. But what is extraordinary about the situation in Laodicea is that despite such a sad conclusion, there is a possibility of coming back. The Lord says, I am knocking, but it's up to you if you want to hear and open. The Lord does not say, if you don't open quickly enough, I will break down the door. But he says, if you open the door, I will come in and then we can eat together. The idea of eating together suggests really relaxing together, on an equal footing, because it's as friends. So Laodicea was not in a desperate situation. What a contrast between the severe warning and the kind of advice they receive. Jesus does not break open the doors. He calls for us to open them and waits to be welcomed out of our free will. That's the whole beauty of the call to repent in these letters. This is great news and encouragement, the opportunity to start all over again. The question asked of us through the letter to the Church of Laodicea could be summed up as follows. Will we choose to be lukewarm, self-satisfied, and only partially committed to God? Or will we welcome Christ as our Savior and Master and let Him take the lead? It is with this crucial choice that my journey on the sites of the seven churches of Revelation comes to an end. Jesus' assessments of these seven churches vary a lot. Some are what we would call spiritually positive. Others, on the verge of collapse, are in their death throes. Some are in a reasonable state, but on a very dangerous, slippery slope. My investigation helped me realize that each letter to the churches contains a message which is relevant, targeted, and adapted to its spiritual state. The messages corresponded with the severe dangers that threatened to destroy them, whether it was from organized persecution outside the church or dangerous seductions seeping from within. The example of the churches of Revelation shows us that we must remain diligent so we won't be deceived or start compromising with the world we live in. 
These letters are an encouragement to us to remain faithful and true to the words of Jesus Christ in times of oppression and temptation. And on this count, the next chapters of the book of Revelation are not quite reassuring. Indeed, the text announces a series of visions and disasters for mankind, which are to take place at the end of times. We can read prophecies describing terror and horror. The text tells us about an ultimate confrontation, opposing the powers of good and evil. The whole book of Revelation is set against the backdrop of spiritual warfare. It is a clash of two kingdoms, the kingdom of light versus darkness, life pitted against death, love against hate, creation against destruction, nothing but friction, no possibility of middle ground. But when all these things come to an end, it is written that good will triumph. The armies of evil, the beast and the dragon, Satan will all be defeated. The earth will be destroyed, making room for a new earth and a new heaven. The new Jerusalem. This old earth that we've lived on is going to pass away. But there'll be a continuity into a, a new heaven and new earth. There'll be a much greater reality. Revelation's key phrase is, Behold, I make all things new. That means that the apocalypse brings a new creation. The destruction of the old world that was contaminated by sin and was under the domination of Satan will make way for a new world where righteousness prevails. The account ends with the declaration and the promise to the church that Christ will return. All these divine visions in the book of Revelation aim at encouraging the church to keep their love for Christ alive and to revive the hope of his return. This is the message of Revelation. Hold on, be faithful. Yes, bad things happen, but I am with you. I am here and I will be here to keep you. And this is, of course, John's message throughout Revelation as he's encouraging the Christians in very difficult, challenging times to be prepared whenever the return of Jesus will occur. Whatever problems there might be in this life, there is a future hope for all of us. There is really a powerful message of redemption, not by force, but by frailty, not by my own strength, but because I will have the paradoxical strength to let myself be carried, to be loved, and to let myself be saved. And that is the message of Revelation, which is extremely needed today. The return of Christ as the victorious King in a great and spectacular finale is the message that the Apostle John left for us on the island of Patmos. Here is the promise he gave to the seven churches of Asia Minor. God really will make all things new. So it turns out that this book is not about doom and gloom. Actually, it is a wonderful story of hope and expectation for the world. The further exploration of this incredible book would require a new adventure for me. But for the time being, this is where my investigation of the seven churches of Revelation ends.